Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we'll explore our guest's personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Please continue to join us for our upcoming episodes, with one exception, always the first Wednesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Betty Nordwind in October, Joe Manis in November, Judge Elizabeth Scully in December, Christina Royce in January on the 12th, and Larry Ginsburg in February. The links are available in the box and on the bar event calendar. Lauren. Good afternoon. You will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. The Family Law Section is sponsored by White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt, and Our Family Wizard. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. That's it for our sponsors. Dan, let's begin the program. Okay. Uh, you all know why we're here. We're welcoming Robert Brandt, founding partner of Feinberg, Mendel, Brandt & Klein, uh, better known today as FMBK Law. Uh, Robert has long been an active member of the community with leadership roles at a number of the major organizations, American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, where he received the National Professionalism Award in 2018, the International Academy of Family Lawyers, the American Inns of Courts, LACBA, BHBA, a vast mediator, judge pro tem, member of the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation for the State Bar, uh, 2020 Super Lawyers cover model. I'm probably missing something, but that's a very busy dance card. So first off, Robert, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so let's jump in. In doing our research for today and talking to some colleagues, one thing kept coming up that I think we should address right at the top. Uh, why can't anybody beat you at ping pong? Well, it gets back to my younger age. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was pretty doggone good. And I decided that I would use that. I would not be conceited, but kind of you know use that as a uh, a calling card when I would go into various organizations as a friendly way of just saying, uh, you know, during an elevator speech, uh, you know, it's, it's great to meet all of you. And I will bet that I will beat anyone here in ping pong. And uh, it got really funny because our firm goes on retreats and there was a young up and coming attorney who thought he was really good. I said, you won't get more than three points off me. And he didn't in three games. So it's, you know, it's cocky, but it's not, if, as long as you can back up your bragging, it's still bad, but it's not quite as bad. I like it. So you're the Michael Jordan of family law ping pong players. I like to consider myself as the Muhammad Ali. Oh, of, even of better. Ping pong because, you know, he would say you do things and they would back it up. And there long, you go. As long as you can do that, you're still a little cocky, but not totally obnoxious. So I think that 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 is a, a great launching point into our real conversation, uh, because the the cover of of your super lawyers uh, uh, magazine was called Calming the Waters. So despite your maybe more pugnacious style on the ping pong table, how would you describe your litigation style? Well, you know, in family law, as I'm sure many of the audience knows, it's you're dealing with some really rough areas. You're dealing with people that are going through very, very rough times in their life. And there can be a lot of tension. There can be a lot of stress. There can be insecurity. 
about whether you're going to lose a house or even more importantly, children. And sometimes litigants and family will get very angry. And my philosophy is, is to keep things calm, not to blow up. If you're living in the same house as your spouse, uh, you know, and the spouse says something that's not nice, uh, the best way to respond is thank you very much. Have a nice day. You know, don't take the bait. Keep things calm. The, the metal detectors in all the courthouses, unfortunately, they're there because of family law. They're not there because of civil litigation or criminal uh, defense or criminal matters. They're there because of family law. People get a little crazy in family law. So I really try and keep people calm, uh, you know, showing strength, but the type of strength that is conciliatory at times. So you want to keep the waters very calm. In, in this area of law, for sure. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you, you have to know your client. The client has to know you. They have to trust you. They have to know that the advice that you're giving them is based upon experience, based upon the law, et cetera. And you also have to know who the other side is. You have to know who the other attorney is. And if I'm dealing with an attorney on the other side who really doesn't know what she or he is doing, uh, and that's not usually the case. I mean, almost all the attorneys that I deal with are very competent. And I always tell clients I would much prefer to deal with a competent attorney on the other side than an attorney who's just, just jumped into family law. So I try and keep things calm. I do not try and, uh, you know, ramp up the, the, the stress and the, and the pressure. There's times where you have to be strong. There's times where you have to uh, make it clear that what you're saying you mean. Uh, I try not to threaten court. I, I, I have a classic term where I say my client reserves the right to go into court because I don't want to be the boy that cried wolf. I don't want to threaten to do something and then not do it. The other side needs to know that you mean what you say and you're going to do what you say. Uh, but again, most cases settle. Uh, you just don't want to settle from weakness ever. And how did you develop this litigation style? Was it from your experience? Was it from mentorship or uh, modeling after other practitioners? Well, it, it, and that's a good question. I mean, it's something over, you know, I've been doing this for many years and I learned that uh, there's always going to be another day. Nobody wins everything. In fact, it's important once in a while to, to not have a good result because you learn. You know, and if any attorney says that he or she is, I've never lost a case. I've never lost a motion. Uh, you know, you got to be careful in believing that. So, you know, I've learned from experience. I've learned that uh, no matter what the stress is, no matter what the problems are, and I tell this to clients, you're going to get through this. There's going to be another day. You're going to make it. You're going to make it through this. You're going to make it standing up. And that's how I try and govern myself is that's not to say that I'm perfect <laughs> Or I don't, I'm not concerned because we are concerned when we're dealing with, you know, gigantic dollars or we're dealing with kids or we're dealing with substance abuse in certain cases. You got to know a little bit about how people, you know, deal with the others, you know, deal with others. And so I try and always stay as calm as I can, unless I really get angry. That happens every now and then. But I so try, you yeah. No, that, that's good. I want to I want to unpack that a little bit. You said that and we know that you've been practicing for a while. What that that prior generation of those family law uh, heavyweights uh, to continue the boxing analogy. Yeah. Uh, what what do you still hold on to from them, uh, either generally or from specific uh, practitioners from from the old days? A certain amount of professional intimidation. I mean, I'll never forget, you know, early on when I was starting to do family law and I had served a notice to produce documents at court. And there was a pretty famous attorney uh, who had been doing it a long time, had a very good reputation. And I, I served a, a notice for him to produce certain financials at the hearing. And we're both, we're checking in with the clerk and I turned him and I, I said, Joe, do you have the documents? And he turns around and he says, who are you? And then he said a couple of words, which I won't repeat, but one word starts with F and the second word starts with Y. And I didn't know what to do. And then we, the, the judge calls the case and your honor, I, I asked for these documents 
and so and so wouldn't give them to me. And the judge said, well, that's your problem, Mr. Brandt. And so I learned from that to be prepared, know your opposition, don't be intimidated, uh, because the, re the really good attorneys, even if they don't try and intimidate you, they can because they, they have so much experience. And so you, you have to know yourself, you have to know how to react, and you have to know not to, you know, not to lose control, you know, to be as stable as you can, even when you're in the face of, you know, significant adversaries and famous lawyers. And, and in family law, we've got some legends, you know, we really do. Things are changing, but we have some, you know, attorneys that really paved the way for other divorce attorneys, where family law now is actually considered a real law. I mean, we really do have the rules of evidence. We really do have to try cases. The, the difference is that our jury is one person. It's the, it's the judge. It's a judicial officer. And sometimes it's much harder to persuade one person than it is 12 people. So, you know, I've learned so much, you know, from the attorneys that I've dealt with over the years. I, I learned things from the attorneys, the associates in my office. I, I'm never... I'm never afraid to go and ask a question of someone who might only be practicing two years because they might be, you know, far more advanced than I am in terms of reset, uh, research, you know, and technology. So, you know, I try and respect all the people that I'm dealing with at all times. So, so what do you do after uh, <laughs> that day in court? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to think if I was, if I called my wife on the way home and started crying, uh, I do know this whenever we would have a little, we've been, I've been married a long time, but whenever we would have a little argument, my wife would say, you know, that guy, Joe, I'm calling him, uh, the guy that you didn't like that day, he's going to be my attorney. <laughs> and she, so she's done that for years. Whenever I, you know, you know, we don't share super confidential things with our spouses, but let's face it, you know, we'll let them know how the day went in court. And, um, sometimes when I indicate, cause you know, I, I can't think of any attorneys right now that I can't stand. There's some that I have some questions about, but uh, yeah, you just try, you know what? Uh, to answer your question, I try to get through it. I may have, uh, maybe we watch something light on TV, uh, you know, maybe like HT, you know, it wouldn't be HDTV, but you know, something to take my mind off of the day in stress, because this is a stressful racket that we're in, in family law, it really is. Certainly. And, and how do you, in general, now that you have more experience, how do you confront aggression or, or unwarranted nastiness from opposing counsel when you do come across it? Well, you know, and that's an excellent question, because there were times in the past where in the days when people were just faxing or tele or, you know, we didn't really have emails, I'd get something and I'd want to immediately send a letter back, you know, saying, you know, blankety blank, you blankety blank. But I learned a couple of attorneys told me, you know, take a deep breath, wait until tomorrow. Don't embarrass yourself because I, every single thing that you send out to opposing counsel could find its way in front of a judge in a declaration. So when I'm dealing with difficult uh, attorneys on the other side, I don't, I try not to take the bait. Uh, I try you know, if they're overdoing it, if they're harass, if their communications are, are really tantamount to harassment, I will, in a professional way, put them on notice that if they continue this conduct, not only is it going to obviously escalate attorney's fees and raise tensions, but it's going to be something that the judge is going to want to see when the issue of attorney's fees arises. And then in family law, uh, even though we this is a no-fault state in terms of divorce, uh, we do have sanctions under uh, 271 of the family code. And if an attorney is writing horrendous letters, letters that are totally, uh, totally contain falsities, misrepresentations, threats, that's something that can wind up with a court saying that, you know, a, a judge saying, uh, you engage in inappropriate conduct. Now, the, the sanctions have to be under 271 against the party and not the attorney. I mean, there's, you've got 128.7 where you can seek sanctions against a, an attorney. And I'm very reluctant to go after 
fellow attorneys for sanctions. It's just it's kind of bad karma because as, as the audience may know, if, if you have a non-discovery sanction of over $1,000, the state bar is supposed to hear about it, you know, the disciplinary uh, wing of the state bar. So I, I don't want to destroy someone's career. You know, if they tick me off, I'll do what I can lawfully uh, to seek my client's rights. But I, I'm not into trying to destroy a career. And, and unfortunately, there are some divorce lawyers that they don't care. You know, they'll, they'll just to see, you know, if they could send another attorney to prison, they would do it. I mean, that's that's few, but that's not how I operate. You know, I try and get along. But I'll say one thing. I don't turn. I tell this to my clients. I don't turn the other cheek. If someone if someone smacks me, I'm going to get back to I'm going to get back at them in a lawful way as much as I can. So uh, I think you have to be strong. At the same time, you have to, you know, be conciliatory and you don't have to take nonsense. So I'm not going to put up with nonsense. You How know. much did your family background, the way you grew up, um, impact that that approach and, and really really lead you to your your personal style? It 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 really did. You know, my father was born in 1907 on the Lower East Side of New York, and he was the oldest of seven children to immigrant parents from basically Hungary, the Ukraine, and a uh, poor family. And when he was uh, Finishing the eighth grade, his parents pulled him out of school and had him go to work. And my dad was kind of a tough guy. He actually got into, uh, he was a taxi driver, but then he also was a professional boxer in the early 30s, literally with his brother. His brother, uh, Murray, was a boxer, and they both were trained by the same manager. And they, my, my, and my father had 10 professional fights. And I was always proud of him because uh, he was self-educated. But when he fought in the early 30s, where there was a lot of anti-Semitism, he fought with the Star of David on his trunks. And he wasn't religious, but he just he, he wanted to let people know, don't mess with me. And as he progressed, uh, he got involved in union politics and became a local president when he moved from New York to L.A., a local president of the amalgamated uh, lithographers, and then ultimately became an international vice president, even though he had only gone to the eighth grade. So he was self-educated and he loved speaking. And it got me into, you know, I, I was impressed. I was proud of my dad, you know, what he had accomplished, you know, with, with very little uh, to work with, no, no really formal education, he didn't graduate high school. And so it was something that, you know, in high school, I got involved in debate. I was in sports. I was in baseball, but I but I love speaking. I love drama, and I attribute that to my dad. You know, encouraging me uh, to argue properly, to speak, to not be afraid of public speaking. So a lot of it had to do with my family. You know, in that regard. And, and you were a rhetoric major, right? So did that I also was, uh, lead you to that? Yes. I mean, I, uh, I you know, I my undergraduate degree was. Uh, a bachelor's in speech, not speech pathology, but speech rhetoric. And then I decided that I might want to be a speech professor, maybe at some, you know, college in the Midwest. And uh, I decided to get my master's degree in speech. I got that at UCLA. And then I was going to work on my PhD in speech. I was offered a scholarship at the University of Illinois in Urbana. But then I said, you know what, uh, this is great stuff, but I like arguing. Uh, I like getting into arguments with people. I like politics. I said, what the heck? I'll go to law school. And I went to law school. I went to law school at night because at that time, you know, I was I married young. Don't tell my wife I was married once before. Uh, and so that was a long time ago. And so I, was, I went to Southwestern at night, four years. Uh, and that wound up becoming who I am today, you know, as a result of my speech, the speech had a lot to do with, you know, enjoying public speaking. So let's pick it up from there. Let's pick up the story from there. You finished Southwestern at night, you passed the bar. What did you do when you got out? When I was studying for the bar, I was actually an adjuster at Allstate Insurance Company. And um, I love settling cases. I wanted to be the adjuster of the month every month, whoever settled the most cases. And 
you know, uh, there would be a rear end accident. And we were all on the telephone. There was no internet at that point. And uh, so I would settle cases. And then as soon as I passed the bar, the manager of the office came to me and he said, hey, Bob, uh, do you want to go to our house counsel, Thomas Moore and Associates, which is house counsel for Allstate. And I said, well, you know, I've got a lot of other opportunities, which I hadn't sent one resume out. And I said, sure, I'll go. And I went to their house counsel in Mid Wilshire, was there about 11 months. The office was about the size of my desk. And then I, I saw an ad in Century City for this law, little flaw firm that said, just call. You don't have to send a resume. This is great. So I called that day, uh, told the people I was working for, the supervising attorney, that I, I had to go do something. And I went to this interview, and it was in Century City, beautiful offices, twin towers. And it turned out it was a little boutique entertainment firm. And they hired me. They needed someone to handle all the lawsuits against this Ferrari dealership in Hollywood. And what I didn't realize is this firm represented a number of celebrities, directors, actors. This was early on in Saturday Night Live. And so I was there for five years. You know, they made me a junior partner. And that's when I started handling some family law. You know, some of these celebrities would have divorces or what have you. And, and so at that point, I mean, I was handling everything, business litigation, contract disputes, and family law. And it started to become more and more. And so when I left the firm, I started handling more and more family law, not totally family law, but more family law. And then eventually I met uh, an attorney, terrific attorney. Can I say his name? Does it matter? You can say anybody's well, I, name you want. I, I met, I met this is Ron, just us. It's just the three of us. It's just the three. So yeah. I met Ron Anto, yeah. who at the time was with this uh, Chodo, Simke, Silverfeld. It was almost like an L.A. law type, you know, from the TV show. They had everything. And Ron eventually uh, was with Kaladin Anto. And he's with us now. But uh, I was at a party, like a, a New Year's Eve party. And I was talking to him. And he said, hey, kid you really need to specialize in family law. And I took that seriously and I decided, you know, I'm gonna become a certified specialist. So I studied for the certified specialist exam, took the exam, passed it. Uh, although I, I didn't want the people in LA to know that I was, when you, when you study for the certifi certification exam, you take this intensive like six day course over two weeks. So I took it down in LA and I told the people that I was doing it with friends well, I'm just doing this to learn more family law. What, what I didn't tell him is that I'd signed up to take the test in San Jose in case I didn't, <laughs> in case I didn't pass. And so I flew to San Jose, took the test and passed. And, uh, and shortly thereafter, within the next few years, that's when I you know, met my, my current partners. And uh, when we merged, uh, I got involved in the executive, uh, family law executive committee. Because well, I knew. Hang on. Let me jump yeah. in here for a second sure. and take you take you back a little bit. Sure. So when you first transitioned into family law practice on your own, and when you left that yes. entertainment firm, how did you decide that you were going to do more and more family law, or decide not just from talking to uh, your uh, that your uh, colleague, but yeah. what else? What did you like about the practice of family law? What made you think that that was what you wanted to do? full-time? Well, I, I like the, the, the personal aspect of family law, where you really get to know your clients, you're dealing with their life, you're dealing with a lot of different, and in family law, you, you have to be dealing with a lot of different areas of law, you know, evidence, children, mental health professionals, accounting, business, uh, probate, wills, and I enjoyed that. I mean, I enjoyed dealing with all of that. And I like the, I, I like the fact in, in family law, you, you, you have discovery, you have potential hearings, you go to trial. And I just, it, 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 I found it very interesting and, you know, constantly, you know, doing CLA, MCLA. Uh, and I, and I really enjoyed it. And for whatever reason, more and more referrals came my way uh, in family law. I mean, I was still handling, you know, from my days as an adjuster, you know, every now and then early on, you know, I would handle some PI matters. Uh, you know, most of those, almost all of those would settle, but I, I started to realize I don't want to handle PI because 
some of the cases would settle for very little dollars. And if I figured out my hourly rate, I was getting like 10 cents an hour. So I said, I can't do this. Some of the cases were good. There were some, some PI cases that you didn't do very much and you got a pretty good recovery. But family lodges started coming more and more my way. I met more people. I started to network to the extent I could. Got involved. I was at one point I was in the valley, got involved in the San Fernando Valley Bar for a little while. This was like maybe 30 years ago. Uh, and it's just more and more now. I mean, for the last 30 years, this is all I do is family law. Nothing. When you first got into it and you talked about the heavyweights before, yeah. was it intimidating? Was it was it daunting kind of that transition point and jumping into the community? Well, that's a good good question, Eurys, because you make me think of an example. When I first started getting into family law and I'd actually become a certified family law specialist, you know, back around 25, 30 years ago, the family law section, it didn't have much competition with CLE and education. And when they would put on an event, a symposium, they would get like a thousand people at the convention center. But they also had uh, every year they would have an inaugural ball, white, you know, black tie. And I'll never forget, I said to my wife, you know, let's go to this. Let me sign up. And I'm going to go out and rent a tux. I rented a tux. And we went to the Beverly Hilton, uh, where it was going to be. And we, we get out of valet. And I see walking in uh, Sorrel Trope, an absolute legend, fabulous lawyer. I saw some great judges. I saw somebody who I've always been respected, like the, uh, Dan Jaffe. Uh, and I saw these people walking in. And I said, they, they don't know who I am. I don't belong here. And I got a little nervous. And I said to my, ah, we're not going to go. Regardless of having paid for the admission and the dinner, we took off. We went to another restaurant. But the irony is, years later, I wound up moving up the ladder in the family law section. And I became the chair of the family law section. And I was the one that was emceeing, you know, one of those events, you know, one of those black tie events. So uh, I always look back on that saying, you know, at that point, uh, my self-esteem was not as good as it should have been. I should have just walked in. Uh, and I've, I've tried to overcome that, you know, to be confident. I mean, you have to be confident. You need to know yourself and, and not put yourself down. But I learned a lot from that. And I look back on it, you know, kind of almost laughing. You got to have a sense of humor in family law or you're in trouble. That's for sure. Certainly. It's definitely, uh, I don't know if the word, right word is comforting, but... Uh... It, to, to know that uh, even you were too intimidated to <laughs> walk in the door to uh, an event back when you first started out. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I well, you know, every time, you know, even in my firm right now, I don't realize that, you know, the younger attorneys, they, you know, they look at me, Jesus is an old man. And so I have to realize that sometimes the older you are or the longer you're doing this without even attempting, it can be intimidating to younger attorneys. I, I learned that personally because I, I went through the same thing myself. So uh, I try and recognize that as I'm walking around yelling at everybody. During the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Um, something you touched upon. So you talked about getting secretly becoming a certified family law specialist. <laughs> that was a good move. <laughs> um, yeah, it's embarrassing, but I have to be truthful. This is the Beverly Hill Bar Association. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, so what, for you, what is the value in becoming a, a family law specialist? I feel that it's great value. And that's not to say because there are some terrific, terrific family law practitioners out there who are not certified specialists. But in our firm, all of our family law attorneys, we encourage to be certified specialists. And the reason that I think it's important is I think it just adds another notch into your bio, into your resume, into what we call your Keech declaration, where you're presenting to the court you know, why uh, your bills are what they are and what your background is. You know, in order to be a certified specialist, you have to have uh, had so many trials. You have to have taken more courses. You have to pass a pretty difficult test. Um, and I just think if you're going to be in family law, it's something that, that I believe that one should attain, you know, should try and attain. 
and, and have that. And it gives you confidence. And when you pass that exam and you know that you're a certified specialist, uh, that doesn't mean you're the world's number one trial attorney, but it means you better know a lot about a lot. And so I, I think it's helpful. And in certain instances, and it's, it's not all about money, you can actually, you know, I think you're entitled to ask, you know, a higher hourly rate. Uh, you know, it, it's okay, you know, to do that. So I really encourage it. I think anyone that's doing family law uh, should consider taking the test. We certainly encourage the attorneys in our office to do it, you know, at the appropriate time. You don't need to do it immediately, you know, coming out of law school. In fact, you have to be practicing 10 years anyway. But I think it's a very, very useful device. And most, a lot of the really well-known family law attorneys that have been very, very successful are certified specialists. And again, I want to again say that doesn't mean if you're not a certified specialist, you're not a great attorney. It's just that I'm not going to lie to you. I think that it's a good thing to be. Really. What about on the other side? When you did you bring any experience back to your practice from serving as a judge pro tem? And, and did that open up any other ideas about either joining the bench full time or altering your practice in any way after having done that? You know, I, I thought about it. I've never really spent a lot of time thinking about being a judge because, you know, I like what I do. Although, ironically, uh, I was appointed to the Jenny Commission about two years ago, which is judicial nomination evaluations. And there's about 35 of us. We've got like two public members and the rest are attorneys throughout the state of California. And we are tasked with vetting applicants to be judicial officers or to reach the appellate court. The governor's office, his appointment secretary will send a slate of applicants to the Jenny Commission. And then the chair of the Jenny Commission then appoints like two of us to investigate each applicant. And it's been a super rewarding experience because I'm dealing with people that are great. We learned so much about implied bias, express bias, uh, diversity. Uh, so right now, I'm helping to pick judges rather than be a judge. And it, it gets a little, <laughs> it gets a little um, depressing when I consider that all of these potential judges are younger than I am. But hey, what the heck, you know, uh, someone's got to do it. So the last thing I want to ask on kind of the on, uh, on your career path piece of it is we talked at the top or I, I mentioned at the top all the different associations and community organizations that you've been involved in, mostly in a leadership position, ultimately. What did you get? What did you get out of that? Obviously, you were contributing the community, but how did that impact you and your practice? Um, and and what what do you think they contribute to the community? Well, I, I I tell this to attorneys all the time, you know, in my firm and elsewhere, and that is, reputation is so important. You know, word spreads very quickly. Judges talk; they talk in their own hallways. They talk about lawyers. Uh, you know, you can mention the names of, of, of certain lawyers, family law attorneys, to attorneys who have been around, and they'll know who you're talking about. So, to me. Uh, respect, having the respect of my adversary and respecting the adversary. That's what I look, look to. I mean, you know, opposing counsel may not agree with what I'm saying. They may not agree. They may not like my client, but, you know, I strive for them to at least believe me when I say something, you know, you may not like what I'm doing, but it's important to have respect, to respect your opposition and to be respected. And that's very important because once you get a bad name out there, word spreads like like wired wildfire, and and that's important. Reputation is so significant, so important, and I think I think most people would agree with that. You know, you want you don't want to you don't want to be someone where you know if I say it's daylight, someone has to you know, but check it out, look out because he said it's daylight. It may not be daylight. Uh, you know, so that's super important to me. And so uh, this at this point, I think it would be good to transition a little bit to talk about your firm. And you did start to talk about how you met your partners. And why don't you give us a little bit more pickup from where you left sure. off about where the firm started? Yeah. 
Well, I met uh, I met Steve Vendell and and Erwin Feinberg when I was actually subleasing uh, from them maybe like 25 years ago on, on Wilshire. And, you know, I had like a law clerk. I may have had a part time attorney working for me and I met them and I really liked how they operate. I mean, Steve, you know, has been the managing partner of the firm for a long time. And Steve knows everybody, you know, and very, very bright. Uh, and, you know, even though I was I was subleasing from them, they moved. I stayed where I was a couple of years later. I'm walking down Wilshire and I bump into Steve. And I said, you know, maybe we ought to get together. And he says, sure. And so I merged with their firm, with, with Steve. And at the time, uh, the firm may have had like four or five attorneys. We now have 21. And uh, the firm, you know, we're, we, it's Feinberg, Mendel, Brandt, and Klein, but we're really branding ourselves as FMBK because we want to have a succession plan. We, you know, there's so many law firms or family law firms that once the seniors are done, the firm is over, it's, it's gone. And we've seen that already with some major, major fam famous family law firms that once, unfortunately, you know, uh, one of the seniors passed away, the firm was over. We don't want that to be the case here. We want there to be a succession plan. And that's why you can't put every good lawyer's name in the lights. You can't have like, you know, you know I see some of these firms with like seven names, it's like, Oh my God, it takes forever for the receptionist to say it all. So if you call our office, the receptionist is going to answer F and, F and BK because we want other attorneys to become partners, to become equity partners. And we want this firm to be in existence when we finally, you know, hang it up, uh, whenever that may be. I mean, obviously, family law attorneys can work a long time. Uh, and we really instill uh, certain principles into our into our a group. I mean, we, you know, we, we like to say we build lawyers. We want all the lawyers to strive to be certified specialists. We want them to go out in the community network. I know when I first joined up with Steve, the philosophy was everybody needs to be on some foundation, some charitable foundation. So our firm, we, we are involved in a lot of organizations, domestic violence organizations, uh, you know, grief organizations. So we really try and instill in our attorneys, get involved in the community, get into leadership positions. We want you, I know when, when we're hiring an attorney, I want that attorney to not be cocky, but be confident. And I want that attorney to, to want to be a partner, to want to move up. And we want all our attorneys to be ready to go to court, not immediately, you know, we, but pretty soon. I mean, you know, there's an old adage, you know, just throw the person in the pool and hopefully they'll swim. We don't do that the first week that an attorney is with us, but we try and do that relatively soon that every single attorney in our office at some point is able to handle the case from beginning to end and not just be a backroom lawyer where they can go to court and argue and write and, and really advocate and protect their clients' rights. And, and we instill that and, and we try and, instill camaraderie. I mean, before the pandemic, every year we would have a retreat where we would uh, go to the desert, maybe Rancho Mirage and, and stay for like the, a long weekend, uh, bring your significant others, socialize at night. But during the day, we didn't do CLE. We would do interpersonal communications, dealing with clients, dealing with difficult attorneys, you know, gender issues, diversity, uh, you know, last year we did have it right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have another retreat, you know, coming up, uh, you know, again, depending upon how this pandemic goes. But we try and have camaraderie. We have Christmas parties. We have summer parties. Uh, we do as much as we can to. And we also reward the attorneys. Anyone that does something really well, uh, you know, we announce it because what we're doing now, we have 10 minute you know, Zoom meetings three times a week, you know, and if you can't make it, you're in court or you're in a deposition, you can't make it. But we really try, and, and especially now where you're not all together, we try and be together, even though you're seeing a lot of faces on Zoom three times a week. What do you think, what do you think the impact of all of those activities and programs are to your firm's culture? 
you know, again, I, I don't mean to, to, to sound conceited for my firm, but I think it ha- what it has to do is it gives us a good reputation. I think, you know, we strive, you know, it doesn't mean that we're going to prevail in every case. It doesn't mean that a judge or judicial officer is going to give us everything we want. But we want them to know that if FMBK is in front of that judge, that judicial officer, that we put time in it, that we really studied what we're doing and that, you know, we're doing the best we can for our clients. Again, it gets back to reputation and respect. Uh, And so I think what we do for our firm you know, doing things for the community, doing things for the various bar associations, having leadership roles. Uh, I think it's good for the individual's self-esteem. And I think it, it definitely is good for the firm. You know, it gives us credibility. It gives us strength. Uh, and that's, that's what we're looking to do at all times. So you talked about at, at some point you do throw the associates into the deep end of the pool, basically, yes. right? You try to, you try to, but what, how do they actually see that ladder? What do you think it is from their point of view in terms of moving up from a rookie to a, to triple a, to, to that partner, whatever you would want to call a partner track um, in, in your world? Uh, Is it bringing in business? What, what are some of the key things that you want to see them do and and what they should be focusing on from their point of view? Well, you know, one of the things they do see, they see that the, we hire, we, we've had a summer law clerk class for many years where we go to the placement offices of all the major law firms in Southern California. And we get like maybe two to 300 applications. And we have one of our partners and another associate kind of head that up. And we have hired many law, cler- many summer law clerks as attorneys and they've been with us and now they've moved up to partnership. So, you know, just the other attorney, the attorneys in the firm can see that we mean what we say, that you could start out right out of law school or at right have actually working as a law clerk for us one summer and then wind up being a partner. We don't demand that you have to go out and get a, a million dollars worth of business or you have to have a major book of business. We say to we say to our attorneys and we encourage them, look, you know, it will if you can somehow develop some business, that's great. But that's not the only thing that we're looking for. We're looking for you to get involved in organizations, to try and strive to be a certified specialist, to you know, do some you know, charitable work, some pro bono work, to deal with some of these domestic violence organizations, to volunteer. Uh, if you can bring in a little business, hey, that's great too, because it'll make you feel good and you know, it'll put a couple more bucks in your pocket. But it's not all about, it's not all about every single associate in our office having to be a rainmaker. We don't expect that because there's some attorneys that are like excellent attorneys, know the law, know the evidence code, know how to argue a case before a judge, but they're just not, their personalities are not such that they're going to attract tons of business. And that's okay. We can live with that because they bring so many other, you know, uh, positive things to the firm. So we're looking for a lot of different factors to move up and, and, and we do, I mean, we, 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 you know, we do have advancement in the firm. We have senior attorneys uh, and we really allow each attorney to develop her or his own lifestyle as an attorney. We do that. We encourage that. And how have you get decided in the first place to grow and to participate in on-campus recruitment? Is your office growing because you want to attract the best talent or is it because you have too much work or are there a number of reasons? Well, right now we have, you know, knock on wood, we have a lot of work. I mean, you know, our, our associates are very busy. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, to a new case comes in, they may not have time to sit in a, <clears throat> excuse me, an initial client, you know, interview, but we have grown. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, when I first merged my practice with the firm, I think we had like four or five attorneys and, you know, I've been with the firm 18, 19 years, and we're now 21. I mean, we're probably, we're w- definitely one of the largest family law firms in the state of California, and we're continuing to grow. You know, we've we've added offices uh, in Glendale. We've merged with the Simpson Law Group, so now we have an, we have a, 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 you know a presence in the Glendale Pasadena area, 
we have satellite offices, kind of like hotel offices in Woodland Hills, uh, in Warner Center, uh, because we have attorneys that live out in the valley. So we we're, we're able to handle cases in Ventura County, Orange County, we handle here and there, but for the most part, we have a lot of friends. We have other attorneys in Orange County that we'll refer to, uh, you know, refer matters out to. But uh, in terms of how large are we going to get, uh, that's hard to say. We only have so many offices in our main, uh, you know, we have the, the ninth floor in our building, our main building. There's only so many offices. So I don't know. You'd have to talk to our managing partner, Steve Mandel, and ask him how many more attorneys but I see us definitely adding attorneys. That's that's for sure. That's for sure. I think Steve's watching, so we'll have him on. Uh, <laughs> He's probably dying to get on. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he wishes he could put, chime in here. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's pivot a little bit um, because we we've kind of been drilling down today, and for the for the time that we have left for our kind of legal topic, if you will, let's uh, do a little bit of a crash course on case management um, and just come up, like just share maybe a little bit with us on what you're looking for, what you're trying to accomplish and what you want your associates to accomplish maybe in some of the key phases of a case. Uh, so let's start out with the first phase of a case, that, that initial client interview. What are you, what are you looking for when, when it's that you're being interviewed, but you're also interviewing the potential client, what are you trying to focus on there? Let's start with that. Well, and that's a, a good question, Dan, because, you know, uh, initial client interviews, is, as we call them, ICIs are very important. And what we, what we look for, you know, once we've cleared the conflict issue to make sure there's no conflict of interest, we've set, we set up a, an initial client interview. And before the pandemic, they would come to our office and we generally spend, you know, an hour and a half, two hours and we would go through almost like a financial application, not getting into all the specifics. We wouldn't need the bank, you know, account numbers, but we want to know what are the financial issues in the case? You know, what are the assets? What, what is the real estate? What are the investments? Where are your bank accounts? And then also children, uh, you know, what's the situation with custody, et cetera. What we look for is, look, we, you know, I remember clients said, what, you're, are you in this for the money? Are you, you know, you're asking me to be paid. Right? Are you an attorney just for the money? Uh, and I like to say, excuse me. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm in this. I like to get paid. I said, when was the last time you went to the grocery store and told the checker up? Oh, I'll pay you next week. Um, although, again, like most firms, you know, we have our receivable issues. But we're, one of the things we're looking at is, it, is it the kind of case that we should be handling Who's the right attorney to handle that particular case? What type of a personality does the client have? You know, if a client sits down, and I had this happen like years ago, a client sits, a potential client sits down with you and they say, well, can you tell me what your malpractice, who is your malpractice carrier and how much do you have in malpractice coverage? Because I just had four other attorneys that, I, that were working with me. You know, you know that that's a case that maybe you may not want to take. So yeah, we do judge we judge our clients and we judge whether or not we can trust them. Uh, and we try and fit the case or, or, or manage the case by having the appropriate attorney in the office handling it. The cases that I handle, I almost always have an associate or another partner sitting with me during the initial client interview. Why, Why is that? Because I'm handling some of the higher end cases and generally I'm able to stack where you know, I might handle certain aspects, but I'll need another attorney to handle some of the legwork uh, to keep the fees a little bit. My hourly rates are, you know, I'm not the highest in town, but I'm not the lowest. And so I recognize that. So I, I you know, but the attorneys that we have, the associates are really they come from great schools, great background. They know the law. They're, they just aren't as gray as I am, you know, not as old as I am. So that's one of the reasons my hourly rate is higher. So I'll have associates, you know, working with me on cases, but, and so do many of the attorneys in there. Some of our attorney, our, our other partners will have associates working with them, but we also, <clears throat> excuse me, have associates handling cases totally on their own from beginning to end. But we want to know the personality of the client. Is, there, is it a client that we can trust? It's going to tell us the truth because we, we emphasize that in family law, 
you got to make disclosures. You know, you got to disclose assets, income under penalty of perjury. And we don't want to be embarrassed by surprises. So we really try and grill the client right up front and let them know what to expect. And that's very what about, good. Important. What about um, setting their expectations? That's something that I think all family law attorneys have to be mindful of when, when a family Absolutely. law client comes into your office. Absolutely. And that, that's often the case in child custody and also you know, when you've got a case where there's a business that you have to value, we have to say to the client that, you know, look, we can't guarantee an exact result. There's a lot of factors that come up. You know, who's the, you know, we need to know the, the judicial officer that's handling the case, how he or she, uh, you know, looks at things, how they might look at attorneys. We need to know the opposing counsel. So we're very careful in not, you know, presenting, you know, you know, giving them nonsense. Oh, we're going to get you this amount. No, no, no. Or, or you're going to, this is how it's going to, you know, uh, wind up. Many clients will ask you right off the bat, what do you think this is going to cost? And the answer always is it depends. It depends on you. It depends on opposing counsel. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on cooperation. Uh, but, you know, we can generally give a client an idea if we have specifics as to what the child support is going to be, what this easier with child support because it's it's guidelines. And if you've got a relatively simple situation where you've got W-2 employees, you can plug some numbers into the computer and let them know basically what the number is going to be, depending on how the custody plays out. It's a little different, you know, in spousal support. Uh, you know, we have guidelines from Santa Clara County. But you don't use the, the you know, the, you don't use software at trial. Uh, so, you know, what I try and do when I'm talking, I said, look, here's what you're going to get from. You're going to get me. You're going to have my attention. I'm going to make sure I get back to you. If you call me, even if I'm in trial and I can't talk to you at break, I'll call you and say, can I call you later? And I really try and encourage the attorneys in our office. You know, clients need to hear you talking. They need to hear, you know, nowadays so much is just done by text and email. So I think it's very important for a client to hear your voice, especially when they're going through stress and insecurity and worries, which so many of our clients, all of our clients, you know, have a certain amount of whether you're the payor or the payee. Am I going to be paying too much? Am I going to be broke? Am I going to be getting enough? You know, what's my arrangement with the kids? So, we're constantly dealing with uncertainties and you never can be exact. And there's no perfect answer to every case. There's never a perfect answer to custody. You try and get the best deal you can, but you know, and you can never find every dollar in every case either. You got to tell that to the client, you know, that we're not going to find every dollar. We're going to get close if we can, but we're not going to find every single penny, nickel and dime. It's just not going to happen. You talked about the importance of knowing the judge or the judicial officer. How do you actually use that info and how much does that, whoever's sitting uh, on the bench, how much might that change the strategy or how you develop the theory of the case? It, it could do it immensely. I mean, you know, one of the things that a lot of family lawyers do is they have, you know, evidentiary objections to declarations. Some judicial officers, you know, that I've dealt with, can't stand those, you know, no matter, you know, whether it's appropriate or not. So if I'm in, if I'm in front of a judicial officer that doesn't really like dealing with evidentiary objections, I still will have to do them because they're appropriate, but I might not do as many. And I want to know how that judge, does that judge take testimony right off the bat? Will that judge agree to a 217 hearing? Uh, or will that judge just rule on the papers? Will that judge, do we know that the judge will read the papers before the hearing? Because one of the last things I get upset with, and most competent attorneys get upset with, you show up and the case, the judge calls your case, and you've given him, you know, 20 pages of declarations and P's and A's, and the judge says, now tell me what this case is about. And inwardly, uh, I'm thinking of a lot of dirty words that I don't say, but that's that's what we don't want. We don't, we want to know. Who the judge is? Does the judge take the bench at nine ten or eight thirty five? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's eight if it's an eight thirty calendar, and we know the judge is going to take the bench till nine fifteen. We still get there at eight thirty or eight fifteen. So, absolutely, knowing your judicial officer is super important. 
The same basic question, but for opposing counsel, does that change? How much will that change your approach, especially you? I mean, you know, pretty much everybody in town at this point. So how much does that history or that scar tissue get baked into the next case? It, it has a lot to do with it, because depending upon the attorney, if you know it's an attorney that unfortunately is going to really run up fees, you know, you want to be you want to be able to deal with that and advise your client. If it's an attorney that you trust and you know has integrity and makes things easier. And I can tell that to the uh, to the client. And sometimes I'm working with a, an attorney that I know from an organization that we we may have had dinner with. And I tell the client, look, I know this person. We, we, we've been at, you know, social events. Uh, you know, I think it helps if you know the attorney. He's not, I'm not going to get you more than you're entitled to because I know the attorney. And he or she's not going to ask me for more either. It's just that we both respect each other. We may battle with each other, but we respect each other and it's going to make things easier. So knowing who you're dealing with is very, very important. And I never underestimate, I don't care who I'm dealing with. I never underestimate, you know, their abilities. Uh, and I've learned that as, as every year goes by is never underestimate your opposition because they may know more than I know, you know, about so, so, certain things. And I respect that. And so something that I wanted to bring up just with our last few minutes here, what changes in the practice of family law have you seen over the course of your practice that really is in contrast to when you first started out X number of years ago versus now? Well, you know, that family law has gotten a lot more respect right now in the legislature in Sacramento, where we're entitled to trials, that we're dealing with people's lives, kids, estates that could be worth multi-millions. So we've gotten a lot more respect. You know, some of the advancements is now, uh, you know, it's still a no-fault state, but you can seek sanctions, as I said early on. Uh, one of the great changes in the law was, you know, same-sex marriage. Um, you know, it's like, you know, everyone's entitled to be married and everyone's entitled to be divorced, thank goodness. Uh, I, I don't really, I, I, you know, look, as I said, you got to have a sense of humor, but uh, we're happy to handle anyone's divorce. Uh, so that has changed. But I think the biggest change is that I think the community recognizes that divorce law, family law, it's law. It's no, it's it's not on a lower scale than civil law, contract law, tort law. It's super important. We have around sixty family law judicial officers in LA County. That's a lot, and uh, and it just says something about you know the community about how important it is, uh, you know, to to have respect. Because to me, that is so important. And I think now family law is respected very, you know, very much. Well, that's the perfect place to close on. And we are a second away from our time being up. So thank you so much, Robert, uh, yeah. for, for joining us today. Um, everyone who's listening, please do mark your calendars for our next episodes. They're all at 1230 p.m. on the first Wednesday of the month. As we mentioned at the top, um, Betty Nordwind will be our guest in October, Joe Manis in November, Judge Elizabeth Scully in December, and Christina Royce in January, but she's going to be on the 12th. And then uh, Larry Ginsburg in February, you can register uh, on the BHBA calendar. Uh, we want to thank Genna, Alex, and Belinda at the Beverly Hills Bar Association and the uh, Family Law Executive Committee, which is led by Carrie Holmes and Ron Reichstein and all of our section sponsors. Uh, we wish everybody a great week and we'll see you here next month.